Okay. <coughs> cool. <coughs> What's up, everybody? Good. Nice shirt. Thanks, 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 thanks. All right. So make sure that you go into uh, the Discord and you sign the attendance sheet with the naming conventions that I set up. So you go into attendance and roster and you put your first and last name, the date, and then, you know, present. So if you guys can take a second to do that for me, that would be awesome. All right. Uh, so if you go into the student resources, it's the first tab on the Discord page. No, student resources. Earlier this morning when I was trying to, when I saw someone put present, you, I think, actually deleted the channel. What channel? The student attendance, because it's not there. Oh, it's not there? No. I'm looking at it right now. Let me see. Student resources only has tutorials, free software, custom guidelines, and modeling shapes. Oh, okay. For some reason, it's locked. Let me see how to unlock it. Permissions. Oh, okay. Sorry. I think I locked it for some reason. I don't trust you guys. <laughs> That's what it is. Jokes, jokes, jokes. All right, see if you can access it now. Attendance and roster. All right, so whoever Hong Kong is, Jordan, I'm um, gonna need you to put it. Uh, put your name, date, and YouTube miles. All right. So if you get a chance. All right, thank you. First and last name. First and last name. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate that a lot. All right, so as you guys can see, I'm just going to run through, you guys, the thread. Uh, so you guys should see your names in your student threads now. So let's go. Let's see if I can. So you guys should see your names populated in the student threads here. And uh, yeah, you guys should see your name in there. And this is where I want you guys to post your stuff. So this is where I want you to post your current work in progress is, right? So the first assignment, this is where you should post it. Don't post it in this one that says student threads. It's posted in your personal one. So I can click on your name and I can see the previous work that you've done. All right, on Wednesdays and Thursdays, whenever you're drawing, whenever you finish your drawings, this is where you're going to post your stuff. All right, so. Okay, so past work goes to the student thread. Yeah, so yeah. Usually the one that's named after you. Yes, yeah. And work for this class goes for drawing threads. No, work for this class goes in student threads as well. The only thing that goes in your drawing threads are the Wednesday and Thursday drawings that we do. That's the only thing that goes in there. So every week you post whatever drawings that I've assigned you inside of the drawing thread uh, so that uh, we can check it out. All right. So other than that, I think you guys should, uh, should be good. I also posted in the student resources. There's a bunch of tutorial links in here for you guys to check out so that you guys uh, so you guys have this as a resource. Also, there's a free software that you guys can access. Uh, okay, so if you guys could do me just one favor right quick and just hit this little uh, mute button on your mics. Whenever I'm doing, I'm getting a, a bit of echo, so it would definitely help. All right, so there will be time for Q&A after the class, and if you have to make a comment, you can just unmute yourself. Uh, other than that, uh, let's keep it moving. All right, so I've added this free software section. Uh, then there's the posting guidelines. I should have uploaded something. I'm going to upload a template for you guys to use whenever you're posting your stuff. And then there's this one that has modeling them shapes. And I posted a bunch of images to help you with topology, geometry, how things flow, and different objects and stuff like that. So 
hopefully this guy, this will be a good resource to you and I'll keep adding uh, more images of 3D models and stuff as the class uh, progresses just so you we have like a nice database that you know even in the future you can always come back to and if you get a chance to you can download these if you want you know you can download them and save them in a little folder for yourself and and use these and draw back to them whenever you need to all right so uh, other than that that's it on the discord so next so today we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about the history of 3D graphics. That's today's uh, kind of topic. So let's see. So today we're going to talk about the history of 3D modeling and computer graphics. Um, it's a lecture that shouldn't take too long. Then I have a PowerPoint after. We're going to watch a video first, and then we're going to go to a PowerPoint. Um, and I might pause it in the middle to kind of gives clearance to certain things and, and um, just kind of annotate as the video progresses. But other than that, um, all right, stay tuned. All right, so we're going to start off by uh, watching this video here. All right, so can everybody see my screen? Let's make sure you guys can hear what's being said. Let me hide, uh, hide my keyboard for a second. Is it this? No. Alright. There's any audio in the video so far? We can't hear it. Okay, let me see this play. In 2010, our technology appeared in most of the world's media. Can you hear now? Yeah. Alright. Alright, so can everybody hear it? Awesome. All right, let's do this. And if you guys, you know, don't if you guys don't get a chance to kind of really watch it or anything like that, I'm going to I'm recording it so you guys can watch it uh, later. All right. So I'm going to turn up my volume. Make sure we can hear it. I'm Bruce Robert Dell, the CEO of Euclidean. In 2010, our technology appeared in most of the world's media. We had found a way to give computer graphics unlimited power. Basically, computer graphics today are made of these little flat shapes called polygons, and a lot of big companies spend a lot of money trying to have more of these little flat shapes so your graphics will look better and everything won't be quite so angular. There is a better way to do computer graphics, which is used in medicine and the sciences, and that is to make everything out of tiny little atoms instead of flat panels. The problem is this particular system uses up a lot of processing power, so the more objects you have on the screen, the slower your computer will run. Having four or five detailed objects will run just fine, but you certainly can't do a level of a game. We got a lot of attention because we made the claim that we could run unlimited little 3D atoms in real time. To understand this claim, you need to consider the state of the industry. There's lots of large companies that are pouring billions of dollars into trying to increase the polygon count. At present, they seem to be able to increase it by about 25% a year. If any of these large companies was to suddenly come out with 10 times more polygons than their competitors, that would be enormous news. But we didn't increase the geometry count by 10 times, or 100 times, or 1000 times. We increased it so far we could abandon polygons altogether and move to little atoms, and run them in unlimited quantities. If what we said was true, then it was the largest breakthrough since 3D graphics began. Two months after announcing it, we declined all further interviews and then completely disappeared. Most people said the technology was too unbelievable and was probably never real to begin with. It's been one year since our disappearance and a lot of people are asking what's happened to us. Well, we're not finished yet, but we'll give you an update as to our present level of advancement. We've made a little island. The island is one kilometer square. This island is made of 21 trillion, 62 billion, 352 million, 435,000 polygons. In the graphics industry, everyone's used to using polygons, so we thought we'd build a polygon converter. By converting polygons to unlimited detail point cloud data, you can then run them in unlimited quantities. We've converted them at a rate of 64 atoms per cubic millimeter. If you're not sure how small a cubic millimeter is, that's a rate of 1 million atoms per cubic inch. If you're still not sure how small that is, 
These are grains of dirt. In fact, okay. <clears throat> So I'm going to pause it there for a second. So essentially, if we go back in time a little bit, so what we do is we work with polygons. And I'm giving you a brief history of um, how this stuff works so that you guys understand where we are all coming from. Um, has anybody seen the latest demo for uh, Unreal Engine uh, 5? Yeah. Okay. So that's closer to what these people are talking about. But I just wanted to kind of give you guys where uh, this is kind of the future. This is the this is what we all want, but it isn't something that is currently available right now. This isn't the regular everyday. What we do is we take polygons, right? We use polygons to make our uh, our kind of shapes and stuff like that. So. Uh, this is pretty much how we are currently working and we're, we're all aspirational. We all want to get to a future where we can use something like a limited technology to where geometry isn't a factor anymore. That's going to make our games look so much better. That's going to make, you know, the movies look so much better because these are everything's represented with essentially atoms now, right? Which is what we're made of, right? So is it's close to reality as humanly possible. We're getting to a point where the only difference between uh, video games or, uh, um, you know, entertainment is if you want something that's going to be real that you can go outside and scan and bring it into the uh, engine or software you're going to use or do you want something fantastical that couldn't exist right so there's going to be two different kind of artists uh in the future which is you know because if you think about it things like disney and um if you think about uh let's see let's what's a good movie like uh Tangled or something like that, you know, like there's no real tangle. There's no real, you know, so you'd have to do simulations and characters and, in, in, you know, how to train your dragon, right? Dragons like that, you'd have to recreate no matter what, because they don't exist in real life, right? So there's going to still be artists to do things like that, but there won't be art. There won't be artists to, you know, go outside and make rocks and assets and stuff like that. Because, well, you can just eventually go out, scan it, and then just bring a bunch of rocks back in, right? Which is what their people are already doing with things like photogrammetry and, uh, let's see, what's that company that does it? Mega scans, right? They go out, they go out and scan the world. Their, their idea is they're going to go scan the world and make it available for regular everyday artists to have these cinematic, beautiful quality uh, CG 3D assets that are based on the real world. And, you know, we're, we're trying to build, bridge that divide. And you guys will, will probably um, notice this since you, since you started playing video games, right? To now that you can see that there is a huge difference in the quality from what you used to get to what you're getting now, right? Because we're, we're upping the polygon count that we can add to our games by about a couple million every year, right? So UE5 is, is leveraging all of that uh, technology, all the processor technology that's being put out by NVIDIA, you know, and uh, RTI and, you know, Radeon and those guys. So it's, it's time for us as artists to kind of, you know, learn the artistry because the technology is, is changing very fast, right? The technology is just constantly, constantly changing. So what we as artists Right. What my teachers have told us to do, what my professors, my previous mentors have told us is don't worry about the tech. Right. Worry about the art side. Worry about creating because a beautiful painting will translate in no matter what the, the medium is. Right. So be a better artist. What I'm trying to say is don't let the technology kind of bog you down. Right. Because. It's, it's only getting better, right? By the time you're like 30 or 40, right, the technology is going to be a whole lot different. Uh, but the techniques, the, the fundamental things that I'm going to try to teach you guys is going to remain the same. Composition is going to remain the same, right? Uh, good workflow is going to remain the same, right? Organization, stuff like that is still going to remain the same. If you know the fundamentals, no matter what piece of technology I throw at you, you're going to be able to adapt and create what you uh, what you want to create so this is currently where we are right now and 
Um, let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna continue it so we can, we can finish the rest of this video. Total freedom now, and there is no such thing as a polygon budget. Polygon counts are pretty low today in games. If we look at things like palm trees and then compare them to say a palm tree made with unlimited detail, our technology, we can see that the polygon budget was pretty restricted. So by removing that burden from artists' lives, I'm sure we'll make a few friends. As for our supporters who play games, your graphics are about to get better. Better by a factor of about 100,000 times. 100,000 is a pretty big number, perhaps we're exaggerating, so we'll let you be the judge of that. The ground in games today consists of a very nice photo on the ground and some blades of grass sticking up from it. This is our ground in unlimited detail, and obviously even the grains of dirt as mentioned before are real geometry. So if you look around, the leaves, the twigs, the blades of grass, all those little groundy type things are now all real. Your game environments will also be real. When I say real, I mean made of little atoms, just like our real world. Your game environments up until now have been a bunch of tricks to deal with the low polygon budget. Things like sprites which are always facing you, or objects in the distance which are just really flat pieces of cardboard. Or things like a cactus where it's very, very detailed on one side, but um, we don't want to waste polygons, so the other side looks like an octopus tentacle. <laughs> Sometimes objects far away just disappear into the fog. This dude is being di really disrespectful right now. <laughs> between different models. I'm sure in the future our children will look back with amusement on these things in the same way that we look back on blocky three color graphics. Getting back to our island demo, I hope you will forgive the repetitious graphics. Please remember we're a technology company, we're not a games company. To have a look at a few individual items, if we look here at this rock, I hope you will permit me to say it looks rather real. That's because it is. It's actually been scanned in from the real world. Scanning technology that brings things in from the real world has existed for quite some time. The problem was what it produced was so high in geometry you could never use it in games. In the future, graphics will be divided into two categories, fiction and non-fiction. What we mean is, if I want to make Super Mario or a dragon or a unicorn, I can't go out into the forest tranquilizer and laser scan them, they're not there. So I need an artist to do that. So the artwork that doesn't exist we call fiction. That means it's made by an artist. This tree is fiction. It's been made by an artist. It's not laser scanned in. The rock, on the other hand, is non-fiction, and the cactus is a hybrid of the two. To make this cactus, we didn't have any cactuses that looked this way in our little part of Australia. The cactuses that we had weren't quite as interesting. So we took the pieces of them, we twirled them around to make circles, and then we added some dry leaves on top, which we changed the color of. If we were a little bit more creative, we would have taken the wings of a swan and put them on a tiger, but we didn't think of that at the time. This island demonstration shows our present level of technology, but that level is far from complete. For example, at present, our island has only two shades of shadows. Just after we made this demonstration, we progressed to having multiple shades of shadow. So in our next demonstration, you're going to find the lighting is going to look a lot better. We're also running at 20 frames a second in software, but we have versions that are running much faster than that, which aren't quite complete yet. Some months from now, our software development kit will be complete, and it will be ready to be handed over to the game's developers. Until then, we're all working as hard as we can, and we hope to produce a product that our fans and supporters will find acceptable. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this presentation. Okay, so that's pretty much the state of computer graphics. Uh, we are still currently using polygons and 3D and those tricks that he's talking about, but our aspiration is to get to a point where we don't uh, have that restriction. We are not bound by polygon count uh, and we can just create freely and aren't just rains and uh, fairies and unicorns and rainbows and stuff. Yes, that's what we want. That's what we want. All right. So do you guys play uh, any video games right now? Yep. Yeah. All of them. All, yeah. all the video games. All the games. Okay. Nice, 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 nice. So, um, what do you guys think about unlimited technology? What do you guys, you know, do you guys, you know, have you guys even heard of it? Personally, I have not heard of it, but um, considering that it would take a lot of uh, 
technological power, mm -hmm. it would take a very long time for any sort of computer to be even able to run it stably. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I think what it does is it does a lot of this stuff in the GPU rather than the CPU power. So it, it's harnessing some, some interesting technology. So, And I think they've got some demos and they have like a game thing that they've already put out. So that's something that's very, very interesting to for you guys to kind of check out and see, you know, where that technology leads. Because by the time you guys are probably, you know, my age and stuff... Um, it's uh, it's probably going to be a possibility. So, yeah, it's it's interesting where we're going to. All right, so yeah, it's going to use a lot of RAM. It's going to for sure use a lot of RAM. If it, it looks like it, it uses a, a ton of RAM. I see. I think of unlimited technology as the. I don't know if you've seen the game, the gameplay of the PlayStation Five. Mm -hmm. that. Did you hear how about the high polys? Yeah, yeah, I heard you about. I, yeah, I've that, seen it a lot. That, that was kind of, that's the only thing that kind of like contrasted for me because I'm. This is my second attempt taking three D modeling. Mm -hmm. And I remember I'm. He's I, the professor I was with, or the the teacher that I was with was uh, Jeremiah Bigley. Mm -hmm. He he mentioned you before, so. Oh okay. Not, yeah, and I remember him talking about saying like, "There's never going to be a point in time where we're gonna just need high polys only." But whenever, whenever I heard that the whole room was full of high polys, no low polys, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was like, well, JJ was wrong. <laughs> okay. okay, so it's not that he was wrong. It's that what happened is in his, what he's saying is there will never truly be a true high poly in the yeah. sense that you're going to still need, because you can't texture for real, for real inside of ZBrush, right? Yeah. So what he's trying to say is you're going to have to do some level of cleanup, some level of unwrap. It's not just going to be make it and done. And I think, though, in the future, future, that might be possible if we can somehow, try, you know, scan vertex color and, and different things like that. So that could possibly be, be a possibility as well. So, um, you know. The thing is, technology is changing, right? Technology is yeah. going up. It's going up. It's it's not slowing down for anybody. It doesn't care what we think. It's gonna keep, you know, keep going. So yeah, yeah it's gonna keep going up. So yeah, um, that's fun. So you came from JJ's class, huh? Yeah, I came from this class. I was I was doing pretty good. We got to the Nathan uh, crate, mm -hmm. the Nathan crate, but I had had English and everything first semester, so everything overwhelmed me. Oh okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so you've got a pretty so, good base. Yeah, JJ is pretty good, man. So you got a pretty decent base. Yeah. So uh, you're gonna be. I'm gonna be looking for a number one for sure. You guys got to prove yourselves to see. I want to see who the best modeler in this class is. Yeah. The, the best modeler, I follow them back on ArtStation, just so you know. All right. So you have something to look forward to. All right. So today we're going to talk about this, the modeling basics, the 3D modeling basics inside of uh, 3DS Max. And you guys are going to get a quiz on this on Friday. So I'm going to go over this. You're going to study, and then I'm going to give you guys a quiz. You guys should take notes or screen grabs or whatever you guys do nowadays. I don't care how you take notes to study, but you're going to need to. All right. All right. All right, you guys ready? All right, so geometry. The solid 3D objects in the scene and the objects used to create them are known as geometry. Usually, geometry comprises the subject of your scene and the objects that you render. So it's kind of like a colloquial term, right? We call all this stuff, this is geo. Right, you know, when somebody says, okay, look at the geo in the scene. So they're saying, look at the geometry in the scene. It's a colloquial kind of, it's kind of like an everyday term for 3D objects. All right, so basics of creating and modifying objects. So the modify panel provides controls to complete the modeling process. 
you can rework any object from its creation parameters to its internal geometry. Both object space and world space modifiers let you apply a wide range of effects to objects in your scene. The modifier stack allows editing of the modifier sequence. Remove the professor out of the way a little bit. All right, move over to the side so you guys can see what's going on. Lock them down. All right. So the basics of creating and modifying objects. The, uh, the Create panel contains controls for creating new objects. The first step is building a scene. Despite the variety of object types, the creation process is consistent for most objects. All right, so there's a variety of objects. Yesterday, I told you guys to go through and look and you know click through and see what you can build, right? If you click a box, some of these operations are one-step operations. Some of them are two-step operations. So that means you have to click a, click once to start the building process and then cl click again to build it out, all right? So the viewport is the default 3ds Max view screen. You have four viewports to observe your model. To the right is the command panel, which has all your object generation and manipulation. The top shelf has basic selection and object gizmos. Translate, rotate, and scale. Holding down on these buttons will expand further options. For example, the scale tool will offer options for uniform scale or scale on different axes. C, 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 that's a lot of axes. Holding down the marquee button will offer other options for, uh, for selection like square, circle, and geometric. In the lower right corner, in the expanded viewport, whichever viewport is selected will maximize on the click of the button. All right, so this is what they're referring to. So if you look at the marquee options, if you hold it down, right, it's going to give you different options. If you hold this down as well, it'll give you a bunch of different options. That's for all of these up here. I'm going to go into 3ds Max and show you guys here in a second, but this is what what I'm what I'm talking about. So you can change your viewport options. I can change it from perspective to orthographic or isometric based on whatever you, you know it as in CAD software. You can change the rendering type from realistic to standard to clay. Um, you can hit this button to render. Then there's the create panel, right? So definitely go inside of 3ds Max and this is how you maximize your viewport, all right? So creating a primitive. In the first tab of the command panel, there are several options for a primitive shape creation. Click the button of the shape you wish to create, then drag it onto the grid. Depending on the shape, you will have to define certain parameters. For a cube, it's simply dragging the 2D square on the grid and then creating the height. So once generated, there are options to modify the primitive before beginning the model, the height, the width, the length. If each set of the same to the same number will give an equal sided cube. So in this panel right here, if I put 44, 44, 44, it's going to give me a completely even sided cube. The segments refer to how uh, many edges, edge loops on uh, which axes will be added to the base cube. So you can height, add length segments, width segments, and height segments. So those will appear in lines on the length, the width, and the height of the box. So all the sides will have more uh, geometry. Yeah, you guys like my, that's my ninja, my cube ninja. All right. So just above the parameter options is the naming and color of the primitive. Naming it, import, uh, naming it 
is important because it keeps the objects in the scene organized, especially when a model or environment becomes more complex and consists of numerous objects, right? Our first model is going to be a coin, so it's going to be one model, maybe two at tops. And we, if you go ahead and simulate it, you're going to have a ton. But if you have a giant scene with like a thousand models, I implore you to name your objects because it's going to make it a lot easier to find whatever you're looking for because you can just go okay uh, pull up my uh, list of objects and then just find it through there having everything named box one two three four five six seven a or sphere one two three four like it's it's going to drive you crazy it's going to drive me crazy and trust me you're not going to have a good time All right so changing the color of an object is purely preference. By default, Max will assign different colors to each object unless it is a duplicate. To change the color, simply click on the color box as you would in Photoshop and the color options will open. The color option is right here for your box. All right. So they said it is purely preference. I'm going to tell you this guys now. It's not preference. If you have this these rainbow colors on your objects, I will lambast you till the night is long. I, I just, one color, use black. One color for your wireframe because that's going to affect your wireframe. That's your wireframe color. And if I see rainbow wireframes, if you guys post any rainbow wireframes, I will deduct 10 points automatically. 10 points. It's a lot of points. Do not make it rainbows. I'm telling you guys that now. No rainbows. All right. In the upper left corner of the viewport, there are the camera and shading options. Under shading options, there are several choices to assist while modeling, such as wireframe and flat uh, rendering options. The option of the shaded, uh, the edged faces allows the visibility of the wireframe on top of the model. And I do this all the time to see how my uh, edge flow is working and to work with my edge flow. I, w I would say I work like 60, 40, like wireframe to shaded view. I hardly go realistic. Realistic is, realistic uses a lot of, uh, a lot of you know computer power and I don't like that so I just stick with either shaded and sometimes I'll even do clay but I don't see it here but sometimes I'll do clay just to get like a quick idea of what's going on and then I do edged with faces because I want to see the wireframe on top of my uh, on top of my model all right so let's talk about manipulating the object so to begin editing the primitive right click above it and right click and hold it. The menu that opens will have the option of convert to at the bottom of it. Choose editable poly. Once the cube is converted, the command panel will open options for manipulating the object. All right. So this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about right here. So you right click on the object, boom, right click it, and it's going to open up this little panel right here and then you can convert it to editable mesh editable mesh editable poly or editable uh path right so you want to convert it to editable poly so here's my little caveat on editable poly i like to think of uh, modeling in 3d sometimes like working in photoshop in the sense that instead of whenever i collapse it to an editable editable poly um, it, it's like a final operation. It's a very destructive way of working. Whenever I do that, I can't go back in the stack anymore. I can't go back and manipulate the base form of the cube. I can't say I want more segments here or less segments here. So that operation's final. It locks in my decisions from my base uh, object. So what, in, what I'll do instead is I'll go to my modifier list and click this guy right here and then I'll drop it down and then I'll just add the edit poly modifier stack on top of it. So I can go back in time and go, okay, well, maybe that didn't work or I'll make a bunch of changes and I can go back and forth. So this is non-destructive. It's a non-destructive workflow that allows for more flexibility uh, in, in your 3D, 3D world. All right. So 
if you select all of these edges, you can ring them, you can loop them, right? You can grow them and then you can shrink them, right? This is how you add more geometry to your model. If I need more edges, this is one of the ways where you can do it. One thing you're gonna learn about 3ds Max is there is a ton of ways to do everything. Everything has a ton of ways that you can do it, right? So uh, some ways are just a little faster than others. And for me, I refer to it as either doing it the granny way or the cool guy way, right? If you want to be the cool guy or the, the cool gal, right? You're going to do it with hotkeys. You're going to be faster with hotkeys. You want to do it the granny way. You're going to be clicking around and clicking and clickety clacking and clickety clack. And you're, trust me, those, those little seconds, they add up, they add up over time, right? A millisecond here, a millisecond there, man. Before you know it, you're you're bogged down by just clicking through windows and panels. But you, if you have them set up to hotkeys, you're just ripping and running, ripping and running. Hotkey to do this, hotkey to do that. I'll show you guys in a video how to make uh, hotkeys and stuff like that as well. So don't worry about that. All right. Depending on uh, the part of the poly you're working on, you will have different options in the command panel. With an edge selected, sequential edges can be highlighted by using any of the buttons under the selection tab. Grow and shrink, add or subtract from the current selection. Ring and loop will be useful selection tools as they assist in making and manipulating edge loops. So, yep, like if you ring it, you can connect it and then it'll give you more edges like we just talked about. Uh, these options are right here, and I would suggest just going through some of these panels and clicking some of these buttons. Trust me, you won't break it, and if you do break it, just close the window and open another one, right? That's how you learn. You learn by trying and failing and trying and failing and failing and trying and failing, and then failing, 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 failing and then trying again, all right? So uh, creating edge loops. So let's talk about the ring. So the ring is... Uh, when you select one edge on the cube, when you press the ring button, all parallel, parallel edges will be highlighted around the object. The loop is the loop button will continue the selection of the highlighted edge until the loop angles past a certain degree. The connect option with a ring or edge selected the connect tool will create edge loops perpendicular to the ring selected or uh, the rings selected edges just to the right of the connect button is the settings pressing the button opens options for creating the loops the setting from the previous tool usage will be the default the three sliders allow adjustment of the uh, number the pinch and the location of the rings. All right, so when you want to make an extrusion, uh, now that the edge loops have been added, you can uh, they can be used to create windows in our primitive building, like this one uh, showed right there. Uh, this can be accomplished by using the bevel and extrude tools. Select each polygon that will be the windows. Be careful that only polygons you've chosen to extrude are selected. Extruding faces unintentionally can cause numerous problems as the model gets more complicated. So then you can press the extrude button and bring up the settings. Under the top option, be sure to extrude by polygon, not by group. The options below will determine the depth of the extrusion. Now that the windows are created, repeat these tools to add more unique designs to the building. Modeling can be a bit of a trial and error uh, as you discover the best techniques for creating the look of the model. All right, so we're going to go through some of this in, uh, in the class whenever I go open up 3ds Max. So rendering. All right, so under the rendering menu, there is a submenu for environment. In the menu, the background color of your renders can be changed from the default black right here, right? So if you click use map, you can select a bitmap 
that you can throw right into this spot and use or you can just use the color and click on this it'll bring up the color wheel you can change the color of your background all right so if you change the background now all right so this is very important everybody I want y'all to take note because if I see any of you people do this I will deduct another 10 points right here we go whenever you've rendered out your image whenever you click this little teapot to render it shift Q if you're doing it the cool guy way or you hit render here do not I repeat do not use the snipping tool to cut out this image right here and then save it as your image I will deduct 10 points if I see you do that what instead you should do is click this little see the problem is you guys are Millennials so you guys don't know what this is who knows what this is that is a diskette and for us old folks that's what that's do you guys know what CDs are yeah. All right, CDs. This was before CDs. This is how we used to save things before CDs. Yeah, floppy disks. So that's what that is. That is a floppy disk. I know you guys have probably never seen one. Has anybody seen a floppy disk in real life? Yes, I still have a bunch of my grandma's house, actually. <laughs> that's cool. That's very cool. All right, you got a piece of history there. Those things... Man, those things used to be the, the thing. They used to be very flexible, so you like bend them and stuff, and they used to be a little part at the top, and you flick it back and forth to make sure it's, you know. So, yeah, it's, uh, uh, that's what that is. So, save your stuff, this little diskette. I know they might have to change it to, I don't know, what do you save with these? Days? You just It's just like a little arrow or whatever. That's like the save button for most things, but they use a diskette, so please save your images. Save it as a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, 1920 by 1080, 1280 by 720, something with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, unless your situation requires something else, but that's rare, right? So 16 by 9 aspect ratio, save it out. Do not use, please, I'm begging you. I, I'm, I'm actually just pleading with you, do not use the snipping tool. Save out your images, all right? I will thank you till the end of time if you do. All right. So the button uh, with the teapot at the top right corner is the render button. Click on this and it will open the render window. But the image, before the image shows up, the render button in the top right corner of this viewport must be clicked as well. Saving the image can be done by clicking the disk icon in the upper left of this menu. All right. And that is it. That's your basic intro into 3ds Max. You guys are done. You guys can graduate now. Are you kidding me? This is it. Boom, you're done. You don't need anything else. Tell the internet you're ready. You're done. You're done, son. You can go apply a bit. Yo, hit hit Blizzard up right now. That's what you guys need to do. Just go, go to Blizzard and say, yo, I learned the modeling terms. I'm good to go. <laughs> I think, I think I'm ready for the job. I think really? you guys are ready. You guys are ready for it. All right, that's what's up. All right. So uh, on that note, I want to talk about what your first assignment is going to be. Your first assignment is, as you guys recall, the Mario coin. The Mario coin, right? The Mario coin. So if you go uh, to my. Uh, to my YouTube, The Art of Struggle. Don't forget to hit a like and a subscribe for your boy. Um, but I have posted the uh, the modeling of this coin here. So there are three different parts and there are three different bonus parts. I wanna explain the bonus parts because uh, these parts will get you some extra points when it comes to taking the class, right? Okay. So part one, I go through um, just basics of how how to do everything, how to model it. I'm gonna go through it really quickly in uh, class. I think. I don't know if I'm gonna have time for that because it's supposed to be like an hour, so. I think I've got like five more minutes. 
but I'll show you where the the tutorials are so you guys can go and start that and then tomorrow we'll talk about if you guys had any questions or what you guys you know thought and uh, everything like that but so the tutorials are on my uh, YouTube channel so uh, make sure you go there this is where you're gonna find the tutorials part one part two and part three I don't know if, if you're gonna get through all of it but if you you know if you do that's fine if you don't that's fine as well this is for this entire week um, so the bonus let's go to the bonus so the bonus is I show you guys how to create a coin pile inside of 3ds max so the idea is to create this so by the end of it you'll learn how to simulate your own uh, coin pile that you can that you can use so it's a it's a pretty cool video uh, if you get a you know if you finish everything else then you can you'll definitely uh, get a chance to 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 simulate and, and do, do this cool stuff all right so for sure you guys need to start this is your assignment right you guys need to start modeling it and whenever whatever you finish today you're gonna go to your uh, threads and you're gonna post it right you're gonna post it to your thread your your discord you're gonna go to your personal discord not your drawing ones not the drawing ones, you're gonna go into the student threads and you're gonna post it, not student resources, student threads. You're gonna find your name and then you're going to post it here. Right? Whatever you did today, whatever you wherever you got to on the tutorial, um, post that in here. And then if you have any questions, we'll talk through this form. Does anybody have any questions for me so far? So when specifically is the coin itself due? Next week. Okay, but like what day? Uh, next Monday. Monday, okay. Yes. Next Monday. And where, where can we check for things like that? Like what day things are due? Uh, let's see. Pretty much, let's see. The, the schedule is right here. Essentially the... So week three, week one, week two, your coin is due. Week three, your crate is due, and then week five. And so all of those are going to be due on Mondays? They'll be due, yes, the following Monday. Okay. So, yeah. And every day of this week, we have to send a photo of the work we've done of that day? Yep. So every day we're going to have to work on it? Every single day. Every single day. Every single day. And if you make it through it faster than everybody else, that's, hey, that's fine. You know, but you are assigned this model every single day and when you get, make it through the end there's another model waiting for us it's a fun one it's a crate Let's see do i even have it up no I, I don't have it up all right but uh any other questions right and for art station you don't you don't have to post on the art station what what you're going to post on art station is whenever we're finished Right, we're gonna present it, and that's how. Uh, so I think that's in. So we're, we'll post something like this. So this is another one of the bonuses. I don't. I don't think you guys. Does anybody have Marmoset here? Does anybody have the Marmoset engine? It's like Marmoset. A, Marmoset. No, Has anybody so. ever heard of it? No. Nope. Okay. Nope. Okay. So it's just a rendering engine. Yeah. So. So I'll you know that's our coin pile. That's the uh, that's what we're we're trying to get to, and this is us rendering it in Marmoset. If you don't do this, this is perfectly fine, right? You, you know this is this is why these are bonuses because I don't think that a lot of you guys you know even have some of the software. So, um, yeah, but. If you ever get it, you can come back and, and do stuff like this. So. Uh, question, question about the free software. Are there any software that we need to have? Oh, you guys can't see my screen. Oh, like this. Right, so this is Marmoset. So you'll be able to make stuff like this and renders like this. Uh, so what were you asking about the free software? Are there any uh, free softwares that we need to have, like, 
Uh, personally, so we can uh, um, work or no? no, you don't um, need any of this stuff. Hopefully, the school has provided you with with what you're gonna need. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think there's anything. But I, the reason I'm giving you guys the free software is if you're not in school and you don't have access to it, there's free options. So you guys aren't feeling like, damn, if I don't have a thousand dollars, I can't do you know what I'm trying to do. So. I, will, I always like to give you guys free options of everything. So like that photo P and GIMP is free Photoshop, right? Because you might only be able to get Photoshop right now because you're a student, right? And it's like 20, 30 bucks a month to use Photoshop, but there's a free program that works essentially like photo, you know, Photoshop on online. And there's one that you can download that you can use that's open source, that's GIMP. So, um, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, it's 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 a struggle for people who don't have a lot of money to kind of get into the field. So I try to figure out a way for you guys to to break a lot of those payment barriers without you know for for a lot of guys. And all you would need is a decent computer, and that's something that you know it's even that I know is hard to get sometimes. So uh, I understand. How do so we actually ask ask? How do we actually get thirty S Max? Uh, 3ds Max, you just sign up. You just go to Autodesk.com. So you just go to, uh, let's see, Autodesk.com, student. And then, so there's a student. You can get free uh, software. So there's the education. Right here, you see it? Free software. So you just sign up. And then, uh, so free education products. So you just click the product that you want for free, and then you would sign in, get the account, and then they would need to verify it. So, you know, you would just send them maybe a copy of your school ID or your enrollment or something like that, and they'll just give you the link to download it, and it's all yours for free. The only issue is that a 3ds Max only runs on Windows, and I have a Mac, so oh, I think okay. I'm gonna only work on Maya if that's possible. Um, yeah, the only thing is with Maya, I can't help you really troubleshoot. Yeah. Um, I do have a video on my channel that I, where I use Maya, so I'm I, I've used Maya. I'm just not as competent as, as I am in 3ds Max. So uh -huh. if you feel more comf comfortable in Maya and you can troubleshoot yourself and you can do all the stuff more power to you but you know if you run into something it's gonna you're gonna have to do a little more legwork to get that problem solved all right yeah so like, any any other questions yeah if like you said if we have to send a photo of our work every day what happens if we don't send a photo of our work and we don't work on it on a certain day um, well the thing is every class I look at what you've done if even if you know um, if you don't post right that's like that's your points for the day but if you have an explanation as to why you're not you know working on it or, you know, I don't you know I, I, I don't know why you wouldn't get a chance to post every day you know I, I guess that's it yeah, like like for me personally, I I um I have my parents are divorced, so I go back and forth, and I have a really really good computer at my mom's house, but I have nothing at my dad's house. I just have my phone, mm -hmm. so like all I can do at my dad's house is show up to class, but I'm still able to do the work. I just I can't do it every day. Oh, the thing is, um, I I guess I don't really care if you don't, um post every day but just write something every day as to okay this is what happened this is why i didn't do this is my next process so i know what's going on because every day the first thing we're i'm going to try to do is we're going to look at your threads we're going to go through every single person's thread and we're going to see where everybody is right what was holding you up if you have any issues if you need any help right like that's the idea of it is to simulate what you guys would be going through in day-to-day -day work life. So, you know, you have to at least, at the very least, have something in there. You can't, you know, even if you don't post an image, you can say, um, didn't work on it, had, this is my intention, this is what I'm going to do next, right? Like, little things like that. You can still type, right? Is that, you know, 
Am, am I am I right in saying you can still type stuff? Yeah, just keep you updated. Yeah, just keep me updated. Right, that's the most important part. You know, if yeah. if your update isn't an image, that's fine. It doesn't have to be an image, but you have to keep me updated every single day. This class is only five weeks. You know what I'm saying? So I need to be in communication with you guys as often as possible. All right. All right. Somebody have any other questions? Mm. Will there be a way to rewatch or listen to this lecture? Yes. And so where would I be able to find that? It'll be all right here on this uh, YouTube channel. So right here, I'm going to have a playlist that's going to go modeling and rendering one. And you guys will be able to come through here and then watch it. So there's also right. tutorials uh, one. And I have one where I made something in Maya, but this is where you can find the tutorials as well. But if you just go into the channel and then you go into the videos, you'll find uh, all of the... The coin videos. All right. All right. All right. Cool, cool, cool. And um, so let's see. So whenever I make stuff, I make a lot of different things for free for you guys. So uh, there's going to be one of the projects that we're going to do the next model. Uh, you're going to need to download one of these wood packs to use. It's this guy right here. So it's free on my. Uh, 3D asset website that you guys can just go get. It's like 30 different alphas for free. So uh, don't forget to check that out as well. I've posted the link to all this stuff inside of the Discord in the info. So yeah, don't forget to uh, go on to the YouTube, watch the videos, uh, and do your homework. All right. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? Have I covered everything? Is anybody is anything still kind of ambiguous? Is you know, and the class? Does anybody have any uh, questions, comments, concerns about what you're going to be learning? I have one question. Okay. Uh, just for like now, like what's the homework that we have to do? Because I got here late. <laughs> okay. The homework is to start these videos that I have up right here. So you're going to go through modeling uh, modeling the Mario coin part one, uh, part two, and part three. Uh, and you're just going to watch those and uh, follow along with in 3ds Max. And okay. then post on your personal thread what your progress is. So you're going to find your personal thread in the student threads. And then you're going to post whatever your update is. All right? Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, it sounds like a no. All right. So I also do a podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the Art of Struggle podcast. I talk about video games and art and uh, different things like that on there. So if you guys want to stay up to date with whatever is going on in the industry, this is... For me, this is how I kind of keep in touch with whatever is going on uh, in the industry. I get to read these articles and, you know, touch on these subjects and, and different things like that. So uh, if you get a chance, check it out. Uh, it's on Spotify, iTunes, uh, pretty much wherever you get your, your podcast stuff. So all right, I will see you guys tomorrow morning. Uh, if nobody has any questions, we can wrap it up for today. I think we're good. All right. Have a good one, guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Good night. Bye. Peace. Bye. Hey, guys.